In this interview with Dr. Andrew Dobo, we will talk about EMDR and Jungian psychology. Dr. Dobo is someone who really brings the art into the world of EMDR. He is the author of the book Unburdening Souls at the Speed of Thought, Psychology, Christianity, and the Transforming Power of EMDR. And he also teaches, in addition to the basic EMDR training, he teaches to advanced trainings on EMDR and Jungian psychology. In this interview, we'll talk about concepts like the psyche and the soul, how to make the unconscious our ally, and many other topics that help integrate Carl Jung's brilliance into the world of EMDR. Here's the interview with Dr. Andrew Dobo. Dr. Andrew Dobo, welcome back to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thanks for inviting me, Roden. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so I want to spend some time talking to you about Jungian psychology and EMDR, and more specifically about dreams. So this is another course that you're teaching, um, and we know that Jung's <clears throat> interpretation of dreams that was heavily influenced by Freud and then he had his own you know method uh, was was pretty complicated uh, and in your book um, you have a six stage model uh, that you kind of break down dreams into an easy to understand way according to the stages you describe in the book so, I'm wondering if you can talk about the six stages model and how it relates to dreams. Well, uh, the six stage model, um, the first part, and and, and um, Shapiro and Jung agree on these six stages. So I didn't I didn't just make this <laughs> this up. Um, and in fact, in the in the Jungian and in integrating Jung with EMDR. Like a lot of the time is, you know, this is what Shapiro says in, about avoidance. This is what Jung says all the way through the stages. So it's very compatible and they sort of run this parallel kind of kind of tracks for both models. But the first is avoidance. Then we're not surprised by that. We know people avoid pain or distress and like pleasure. So the first is avoidance. The second is surrender. And we know people usually, you know, they wait and wait, put things off until they can't bear it anymore. And then they just give up. OK, I'll go see the counselor because I can't I don't know what's wrong with me. So they sort of surrender. And then we know for EMDR to actually work, that the client has to surrender to the process. You know, you can't have an agenda. You just have to whatever wants to happen, happen, allow whatever wants to happen to happen, which means surrender. Right. So that's the second. The third is sort of the dismantling of the old way or dismantling of the negative belief or destruction of the part of, you know, this way of it's not working, uh, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, if we take the example, I don't matter, we're going to we're going to find images that, that match up to I don't matter moments and start dismantling that once that starts to dismantle, then there's a there's this sort of loss of identity and Shapiro talks about loss of identity whenever you're working with EMDR and and Jung calls that's where Jung would describe a period of chaos and confusion sets in which is loss of identity can make you feel like you're in limbo and people use that term all the time when I work with them you know I, you told me about this but when's how long is this going to last I don't know how am I going to get out of here the one thing about that I should mention though but Jungians also call that period a period of creative introversion where it's required, like Jung talks about, you know, you have to go into this sort of desert, like, you know, 40 days in the desert, like with Jesus or whatever. And so you have to just shut things down. You have to be contemplative, you know, spend some time in sort of this introverted way, because it seems like nothing's going on, but there's a lot of stuff going on under the surface. And you sort of have to figure out, okay, what is this new chapter in my life going to look like? 
And that would be this fifth stage, which is kind of like the renewal, the rebirth, this new way I do matter. And what does that look like? You know, how what does that feel like? People don't really know how to matter if they spent their whole life not mattering. So it's a little bit of like, you know, uh, people have uh, dreams of babies and toddlers and little fledgling weak animals because they're just sort of getting their, you know, sea legs back to try to figure out how to matter. And so those kind of images are in those dreams in that stage five. And then stage six is when you sort of assimilate the new way. And now you don't even remember what the old way was like. You sort of have accepted this new, I do matter, I have value, and you're going to behave in that way and insist other people treat you like that. So those are, those are the six stages. It's a Jungian thing. Jung, uh, Shapiro talks about stages. Jung talks about stages, but they never really laid it out in those kind of six distinct stages. And uh, with EMDR, it, that people seem to follow that, you know, and you can really see the stages because EMDR really does accelerate things. So it's not like this is takes a decade or anything. You can kind of get through this in a sometimes a year, maybe less, more, it depends on the person, you know. Yeah, one of the things that I appreciate um, about your six stage model is something that you say in the book that one can be in more than one stage at any given moment. Uh, and I think that's, you know, when it comes to confusion about EMDR, sometimes that's where some of the confusion comes because it's being taught such in such a linear way that we're thinking, you know, phase eight phases of EMDR, phase one, phase two, phase three, but sometimes a person can be in more than one phase in, in the eight phases of EMDR, not only in the six stage model that you describe in your book. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, but being in the eight phases in, um, in Shapiro's model, I'm not sure I know how you would do that. I mean, if you, I mean, if you're in five, you're in five, if you're in four, you're in four. Um, so one, one of the things that I think about when I, you know, one example is that a person is doing active reprocessing. So the, the desensitization phase, but they also need resourcing. Uh, they're done with, you know, that phase, but they need more of it. That, that's how I look at it. Okay. Yeah, more kind of in a macro kind of way, not in the right. The exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, and that's that's actually a good parallel to the six stage model because the six stage model it does take a time to break down the, the the old way, and they have to spend time in phase four, you know, and then they try to find their way out of it. But in in just in a matter of two minutes, like let's say somebody doesn't matter, that's their core belief, right? And now they're starting to push back and set healthy boundaries. So one example I use, I had a client whose daughter would always call and want to come for the weekend. She's grown and her mother's older and tired and she expects her mother to kind of take care of her on the weekend. So she's always, she does this whenever her husband goes out of town. So, um, so the daughter calls and the mother says, no, I'm too tired, honey. I don't really want anybody coming over this weekend. And so the daughter's never heard that before. So she's yelling and can't believe it and saying, you know, screaming at the mother on the phone. And she says, sorry, I, I really am too tired. And, you know, she hangs up and we rehearsed this and we did EMDR, our future template, because we knew she's calling. Right. So that was good. Right. I matter. That's phase five. I matter. I, she did an I matter move. And now she feels guilty. She's not sure if she wants to be that person who's going to say no to her daughter. And, and so she calls her daughter back. Oh, honey, you could you could come over this weekend. So now she doesn't matter. Right. So so she was like phase five. I do matter. Chaos and confusion sets in. Oh, I don't know who I am. OK, you can come in. OK, now we're back to back stage three. I don't matter anymore. Right. So that happened in a matter of two minutes. So, but then, you know, so there's this kind of long, slower move, but that's just data. So we just, okay, so let's, let's target that. You feeling bad, you know, let's get rid of this inappropriate level of guilt. And, and you help them work through until that, that phase five that I do matter is strengthened and, and they push through. And then they, the next time the daughter called, she, she didn't come to the house. The mother kept her foot down and, and the daughter had already heard no. So then that, that was taken care of. So that's that's what an I matter move looks like, just saying no sometimes. Most of the time, it's just that. Yeah, I want to I 
go back for a second to chaos and confusion um, because we know from um, Jung's biography that he went through a process, you know, a, a, this whole process of chaos and confusion sometime in his midlife. Um, what are your, what, what do we know about Jung and what happened to him? I think it was around the time that him and Freud kind of stopped cooperating um, and doing work yeah. together. Yeah, I think that was those the Red Book years. Um, that's you know that's when he really started to engage his unconscious, and he had these fan you know these images, and uh, I think Electra was one, and Salome, these figures that he had in his imagination, and he would work with them uh, in the Red Book. So there's the dialogue, which is like you would consider active imagination, and he was also broke away from Freud and had to sort of become his own man because he wasn't really buying the whole Freudian thing, which was, you know, hard to do because, you know, everyone knew Freud and no one knew Jung. And so it was kind of a scary time, but that is certainly a dismantling of who he thought he was and trying to figure out who he is. And he's, I think there was, that was a long time. I mean, he didn't have EMDR. I, I mean, I think those that Red Book started like 1913 to 1930 something. It was a long. It wasn't like five years. It was a long process. Um, uh, but but that's what I know of it. I wouldn't say I'm a a Jungian historian. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I I want to Andy. I want to end with one of my favorite quotes from your book. Um, you say, and this is a quote, for me, I cannot imagine doing this work without the aid of the client's unconscious mind to help us along. It is a powerful ally, and it seems foolish to squander its power by refusing to honor it. Can you say a few words about that? Uh, well, yeah. How, how does that manifest in a session? Um one of the a couple of key things that Jung says is that um, absurdity is just as valuable as meaning, right? So we all value meaning and logic, but we don't value absurdity, right? And so what is and what and some other Jungian uh, terminology um, is common phrases, cliches, those kind of things. Those are Jung says those are those are the less a language of the unconscious. So if you're hearing those, that that's when the unconscious is really an ally here for you. Um, and if you listen for it, it's assisting, it's helping. So that's happened to me. Like all, once I became aware of this, those things, you're there's this aid coming in almost every session. Um, and it's funny because I only just started doing the the course and. A couple times and so i had a nice group about 15 people and so the last thing that we do is they do some emdr and they have to pick either an i don't matter i'm not good enough because everybody's one of those so they're just processing that mindfulness and they're just listening for these phrases and they're all catching some of those phrases um and if you go with one of those phrases it's highly generalizable so Oh, what am I talking about? So, for example, let's take the phrase. What if I had a client who she says, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting at the, at the sink doing the dishes, my own business, and I have a panic attack. I mean, a panic attack, it comes out of the blue. It comes out of nowhere. I'm just sitting there doing the dishes. There's no one here. I got nothing to be afraid of, and I have a panic attack. So I'm going with out of the blue. Okay, go with that out of the blue. Now she was in a domestic violent relationship and her husband would just kind of walk by her and just smack her in the face sometimes. And that punch would come out of the blue. So if you go with out of the blue, anything like that in, in this woman's life that happened that came out of the blue, it was like, it's just a laser right through all of those moments. So out of the blue is a highly generalizable statement, even maybe more so than like I'm not in control or something. So when I hear that, that's like the unconscious is just, here's this offering. I hope you hear it. And you go with out of the blue and they run right to the domestic violence uh, relationship that she had. And she just did, you know, a dozen kind of, you know, she just went on and on and on and on and it was out of the blue that opened that door for us and and there's a million of them i just somebody just um 
yesterday came up with uh, heard one. Oh, yeah, because because I said so. Like, that's what her mother would say to her because I said so. OK, go with that. Well, how many times do you think her mother said that to her? And you're on this kind of mother channel of because I said so. So those if, if you know, if I get if someone says, oh, my shoulders are tight, I'm feeling kind of angry. You but then I hear because uh, my mother always say because I said so. I'm going with I'm going to isolate that. I might I go with because I said so. And things go quickly fast. You know. Yeah. Once you start, once you start paying attention to that kind of stuff and you start to see how valuable it is, you, you hear it all the time. It, it's always there. The unconscious is always helping. Yeah. But we don't, yeah. we don't ever listen. We're never, we're not trained to listen. Right, right, right. So we have to make the unconscious our powerful ally. It is the ally. You just got to listen for it. Yeah. Dr. Andrew Dobo, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks. I love talking about this stuff. As you may, as you could probably tell. Yeah, and I, I'm going to link, link below the, the video to your different trainings. So you have, can you talk a little bit about the two different trainings that you are, te well, you're teaching three different training. One is the basic EMDR training, and then right. two that are influenced by Carl Jung. Uh, so can you can you talk a little bit about these two trainings? Yeah, um, yeah, the two day training that I do, um, it's really uh, understanding, a, you know, Jungian theory, uh, the six stages and how and the parallels. Um, we do some dream work, like, you know, I ask people to bring in dreams and I use dreams to demonstrate the stages. I have, you know, uh, videos of clinicians and things that I've uh, that have shared their dreams and they fit into some, some of the categories that we work with. So it's a more comprehensive, uh, but we do talk about dreams. So there is some, uh, you know, education about dreams. So people can go back and start working with dreams. And then um, the other dream, the dream training, it's six hours. It's like, it's a day. Um, and it's mainly focused on the dream work and just more of the dream work. So uh, not so much about the parallels and a lot about the stages, a little bit about it. So you have the context, but I don't go into a lot of great detail. That's more focused on, you know, here's here's uh, some information about how you can use dreams in your work. And then you can go back and try to integrate dreams into your into your work. Yeah. So EMDR and Jungian psychology is definitely a, a better way to expand our our view of and, and depth of EMDR work. Andy, thank you so much for your time again. Thank, thank you, Rema. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Mm -hmm.